want to thank you for coming tonight. My name is Ryan McNeil. I'm the Mass DOT project manager for the I-94 and I-95 interchange improvement project in Hopkinton, Westboro, and Southboro. Uh, we don't have a lot of folks here today, so we've got a presentation, but um, contrary to sometimes we ask folks to wait, keep their questions to the end. Um, if you have a question, just let us know if you want us to stop or slow down about something or clarify something, or if you have input you want to give us, please just let us know. We'll keep this kind of informal. I like the discussion aspect of these meetings a lot better. We get to understand what, what you folks are thinking and concerned about, and uh, we can sometimes convey our information a little bit better. The agenda for tonight's meeting is uh, fairly straightforward. It's to introduce or reintroduce the project team to talk a little bit about the project area and the project purpose and need, which is very important. Give you an update on some of the data collection that we've conducted over the last year or so. And then we're gonna, we're gonna try and slow down a little bit and show you the four alternatives that we're currently considering uh, to improve the interchange. They are on the boards here. I think most of you had a chance to take a look at them. Um, and we'll stay as long as folks want tonight after the presentation if you have further questions about those. And then the last part, the real meat, is um, the alternative analysis, the, the, we call it the measures of effectiveness. We have, uh, we're getting more of this towards the end of the presentation, but we've done a considerable amount of work on analyzing those alternatives. We've got 26 or so different criteria that we've uh, collected data for across all the alternatives to help the department and you folks help the department uh, select a preferred alternative that then we'll bring through design and the environmental process and we'll eventually get built. Uh, this, this is the second public meeting. We were out here um, about a year ago. I not guess. quite a year ago. Yeah. Uh, not, maybe nine or ten months ago. Uh, to present in Hopkinton and Westboro. The intent of that meeting was really to talk about the problems with the existing interchange. Uh, if you're here today, you live or tra travel through the area, so we don't have to tell you a lot about the, 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 the problems with the existing interchange. Fairly self-explanatory. Um, uh, we're going to share the, t tell you where the project is today. We're going to share the results of the data collection. Um, really, we want to obtain input on those alternatives and how we've evaluated those alternatives. Project team is Mass <coughs> DOT Highway Division. We have a lot of support and uh, um, uh, our partner with the Federal Highway Administration. And then the design consulting team is led by HNTV, but also includes Petrotech, Howard Stein Hudson, HMMH, and Green International. So I'm going to turn this over to Joe Cahill with HNTV to start walking through the piece of paper. All right, thanks, Ryan. This is the project area. Uh, just to locate everyone. Uh, I'm not sure which one's the pointer. But outlined in yellow is what we're calling the project area. So that's, um, it runs I-90 east-west, 495 north-south. Up at the top of the picture, it's Route 9. Um, we have Westboro up in the northwest, Southboro, and Hopkinton, and it's centered on the interchange right in the middle of the screen. So, I'm sure everyone knows, 495 and 990 are two very um, heavily traveled, very important, very critical um, parts of the state and the region's transportation infrastructure. Um, as I'm sure you also know too, they, they suffer from heavy congestion and um, high crash rates. So. Our, the purpose of this project is to improve safety and operational efficiency at the system interchange of these two nationally and regionally significant highways. So what we're finding is by improving the geometric deficiencies and eliminating the weaving movements, the interchange will, will achieve, the project will achieve the, the goals of reducing crashes through the interchange for all movements, reducing recurring congestion within the interchange, um, me, reducing the current the queuing that routinely extends onto the mainline highways I-495 and I-90, and redu uh, reduces travel time through the interchange for all the major movements. So like Ryan said, we were here uh, not quite a year ago. We presented a lot of data. Um, for those that were here, it was very traffic focused, safety focused. Um, we did, we just want to go through and update some of that data. Uh, we went out and collected new traffic data after 
the toll plaza was the toll booths were removed and the, the new configuration were put in place. So we wanted to get new data, new traffic data to reflect that. So we did collect that towards the end of last year. Um, so we're just going to touch on some of those the results there. Um, and also, um, we're going to uh, just talk a little bit about safety and, and environmental um, resource data collection we've completed. And then Nate, Nate Cabral Curtis, who you might have passed on the way in, is going to talk a little bit about um, the public engagement effort or the public engagement feedback we've received to date. So this is the new data. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail as you it, it's heavy movements throughout the interchange, but just a couple to point out. Um, eastbound I-90 to northbound 495 and the reverse movement. So that's, that's a heavy movement in the morning peak, and then it's a reverse movement in the afternoon peak or the evening peak. A, um, that's one of the heavier movements we see through the interchange. Um, the heaviest movement, though, that we do, we have found is westbound I-90. So the westbound turnpike going through the interchange to 495 southbound. Um, in the p.m. peak hour, so that's in the evening drive home time, basically. So just uh, again, a um, couple quick takeaways. We found, as you can imagine, the existing interchange does not meet the current demand and projecting that forward, we're projecting that it's not going to meet the future demand as well. Um, we're also finding that the peak period, so the period where you see that real peak heavy traffic time, is actually spreading out. It's getting a longer period of time is considered it, so the traffic impacts are growing through in the morning and the evening peaks. We also are still finding the queuing, the, the traffic backing up onto the mainline highways, and the weaving movement um, through the primarily through the toll plaza area. Toll plazas are gone, but the weaving movement still persists. Those desire movements for people to go from I-92 I-90 westbound to 495 southbound still very much exists. So this is a map showing the traffic density through the interchange. Um, and in the morning, so this is a morning peak hour, you can see there's some very, um, very pronounced heavy movements. Um, just to put in perspective, anything essentially red or darker is considered level of service F, which is considered failing. So you can see there's some very dark movements. Um, coming off of I-90 eastbound through the interchange, likewise I-90 westbound, um, and really it's heavy movements throughout the interchange. Um, and you see a number of yellows and oranges, so they're all heavy. <coughs> um, the density in the PM peak, again, throughout the interchange we see heavy density. Um, <coughs> I-90, there's that I-90 westbound to 495 southbound movement is quite heavy with high density. Um, we also see heavy movement from 495 southbound into the toll plaza area to diverge. So projecting that forward to 2040, I won't go into a lot of detail on the numbers, but you can see, um, we see growth throughout the interchange, and we see the heaviest growth actually on the 495 mainline highway, so the 495 highway northbound, northbound in the a.m., so northbound in the morning peak, and southbound in the evening peak. So safety. Um, Again, we presented this last year, so we won't go into a lot of detail, but the key takeaways here, this interchange is a high crash location. It averages, it's, or it's, averages about two times the statewide average for crash rates. Um, we're seeing a crash about out there about once every four days. Um, there's crash clusters located throughout the interchange. So just this map, and for those that were there last year, you might remember this the same. Um, we have crash clusters, like I said, throughout the interchange. The off-ramps, we have short deceleration lanes, tight radius curves. Um, so you can imagine people having to slow down on the main line, slow down quickly for the radius, for the tight curves as they're decelerating off the highway. Um, leads to uh, possible rollover crashes and, and so on. Um, we also still have that weaving movement right in the middle of the interchange. So um, in addition to the traffic and safety, we collected uh, a significant, significant amount of environmental resources data. Um, we identified perennial and intermittent streams. We identified the wetlands throughout the area. Um, we're in the middle of the Cedar, the Cedar Swamp area of critical environmental concern, ACEC. Um, we've identified a number of vernal pools throughout the area. Um, we've inventoried the Atlantic white cedars, uh, tree by tree basis. Um, 
We've worked through the threatened environment and endangered species. One species is no longer threatened, but now there's a new species that is threatened in the area. Um, and then we've identified the FEMA regulatory floodway in the bordering land subject to flooding. So just to put this in perspective, as far as where the interchange is and what we're dealing with from an environmental standpoint, um, the, sh the hatched area, the shaded area, and the light blue, that's wetlands. So this interchange is essentially sitting in the middle of wetlands. Um, throughout basically northeast of the interchange. Um, so you can see we're really constrained as far as, as the, the area that is, um, is not within the wetlands. Nate. That's so Nate coming. There he is. <laughs> so in addition to being the greeter and traffic cop in the front door, I'm also the public outreach guy. Um, so uh, this is just a chronology of the outreach that we've done to date. Um, we were very busy with two public information meetings uh, last uh, November uh, in Hopkinton and Westboro, the two towns in which the interchange is mostly resident. Um, and then we went on and did um, some stakeholder briefings for uh, a set of specific kind of groups, um, local business, uh, such as uh, Dell EMC, which of course is headquartered here, um, environmental groups, um, folks who serve uh, underserved populations, and then regional organizations like uh, transit RTAs, chambers of commerce, things like that. That was all in uh, Q1 of this year. And then um, many of you may have seen, uh, if you've been to some of the other uh, presentations or seen our advertisements for it in your uh, town halls, public libraries, and rest stops on I-90, uh, the Wikimap, which was a way for people to leave feedback about the project um, online on their own time. And I'll show a little bit of that in a minute. So the great news about this project is a lot of times we find ourselves in the sticky situation where um, the technical team will come up with one set of findings and then the community comes back at you with their own lived experiences and they're like way far apart. And I sit there at my desk and I go, oh boy, I'm gonna have to work hard to get those two views together. The great thing about this project is the public view and the technical view are almost in perfect alignment with each other, which is great. Um, the comments focused on, from a driving perspective, congestion and safety, which Joe just showed you a wonderful diagram of, and then the fact that, yes, the interchange sits in the middle of a you know sensitive environmental area, and wouldn't it be nice if we do something to uh, improve that? So driving, the key themes, it all lines up. You know, congestion from the on and off ramps, trails back onto the main line. People feel very exposed being that last car on I-90 uh, westbound headed towards Worcester trying to get into the interchange. I've done it to come to these meetings. Merging movements are dangerous. People get aggressive and drive faster than they should for the conditions out there. There's spillover traffic that you know tries to avoid the interchange and travels on local streets. Um, and trucks in particular have a tough time as they try to merge onto I-495 southbound because they dip down and then they have to go straight up a hill. Um, which is bad enough in an auto, and it's certainly uh, probably much more difficult than a heavy truck. The environment, everything that we already went over. Um, everybody would like to see uh, something done about you know, the water flow, how can what was there before the interchange uh, be in some way restored, given the importance of that habitat. Um, this is that wiki map. Um, you probably saw this at the beginning. When I first showed this to you uh, last fall, it was mostly blank. But I, again, when I talk about this alignment between community input and um, what, uh, what we found in our technical um, evaluation, if you take a look at this, right? This is, remember when you saw um, that the off-ramp from I-90 uh, westbound into the interchange, that was that black, black color, you know, really not doing well at all. This cluster of auto comments down here is all about I'm always the last car in line. It makes me very nervous. If you look at this, this is in the area of the old toll plaza, and those are all people complaining about the merge. You know, people are weaving back and forth across each other. It's dangerous. I don't like it. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, truck concerns right here, getting ready to go up that hill. So you can also see some on the ramps, you know, concerns over the rollovers. So everything that you would expect from the technical analysis is really nicely borne out here. Um, you can read the percentages. Again, no surprise there. Um, 
I think the, the quote is uh, illustrative. During the evening commute, there is an issue with cars driving the left-hand lanes and cutting right at the last minute to exit, causing a slowdown on all three lanes. There was an interagency coordination meeting um, some weeks ago. Um, there was a gentleman there from the Federal Highway Administration, which is participating in this project, and um, they actually saw just that maneuver um, while uh, they were out there. So, you know, just on a random chance, the day that the project team went out to take a look, there was exactly the problem that everybody had told us about. Um, and again, this is exactly what you would expect to see. It's about congestion. Um, it's about the merging. It's about people's feelings that it's not a safe place to drive. I-495 backs up both north and south approaching the ramps to I-90 during most commutes, weekends and any time during the summer. Um, and it's funny, coming into the interchange from Boston, you know, we left um, today at 4 to come out here and set this up. Um, and approaching the interchange, we were in stop and go for um, mile after mile to, to the extent um, that we, um, we were putting in some directions and the phone actually told us to try to get off to a state police barracks, which I opted not to do because I wanted to come to the meeting rather than be arrested. Um, so at this point, I will turn it over to Jonathan Kappas, who will talk to you about the actual interchange concepts. Yes, sir. This red fellow, the red fellow in the night. Yep. Uh, so, in 2015, we were given a certification for the environmental notification form and allowed to advance uh, three concepts, 14.4, 14.5, and 22.3. So, we began refining and revising those alternatives to better fit them with the environment that's out there, work with the horizontal and vertical alignments of those, of those uh, ramps to improve them both for traffic and for minimizing their impact to the large amount of wetlands that you've already seen tonight. Um, as part of that, you'll see a fourth alternative tonight, C2. Uh, during the revision process, uh, we found that there was another alternative. So we continued to advance that one as well. I'm going to start with some common improvements for all the alternatives, so we don't have to talk about the same thing four times again in, in a row. Um, for one, uh, this bridge right here, which is 495 over 90, this bridge right here, which is 495 over the MBTA CSX, and that bridge right there, which is 90 over the MBTA CSX line. Um, those are all going to be reconstructed as part of this project. Uh, in addition, the Fruit Street Bridge over 495 would be reconstructed as well. Uh, 495 itself, heading northbound, uh, we're going to shift 495 northbound uh, into the median. This does two things. One, it facilitates faster construction. And two, it gets us farther away from the wetlands that are on the outside. So when we add on acceleration lanes and things like that, we're not impacting the wetlands immediately, which is what happens when you have wetlands everywhere. Um, and then finally, you'll see the yellow line goes all the way up to the Route 9 exit now. So that right there was a part of the refinement process. We did our traffic analysis, and we realized that there's a lot more friction between the weaving, car the weaving cars coming on from 90 going northbound, getting off on nine eastbound and the through movement traffic on 495 northbound. So to try to minimize that, we added an auxiliary lane between the on-ramps and the one off-ramp right there. So those are the common improvements uh, for all the alternatives. I'll go into specifics now for each one. Uh, concept 14.4. Uh, this is the simplest of all the alternatives in terms of improvements. Uh, we add a, what I'll refer to as twin ramps. Uh, you have a ramp coming from westbound to southbound, so I-90 westbound to 495 southbound. That, that ramp comes in in the median of 495 southbound, so you're coming in on the high speed lane. You have a parallel ramp, so it's twin going from 495 northbound to I-90 eastbound. 
So those two ramps are the major improvement in this alternative. There are a number of uh, lesser improvements to get design speeds up on these ramps here. But generally, for all the other movements, your traveling through the interchange stays largely the same. What this alternative does, and what all the alternatives do, is eliminate the weaving within the interchange. Um, and then I'll just emphasize again, this goes down in through the median, which means that you have traffic coming in on your left side and on your right side on 495 southbound right here. 14.5 takes 14.4. Oh, yep, sorry. sorry. Can you go back to 14.4? Does anybody have any... After each of these, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions about the paper. <laughs> I know it's tough to kind of drive through there, seeing it for the first time, so the folks want to take a minute and kind of see how they would get from each direction to the other direction, please. So you're coming west down on the pike, yep. to south on 495, and that's going to come in by the Food Street Bridge? Correct. So you'd actually come in just under. So if you know where the, the connector bridge is right now, that takes you from the from 495 to the toll plaza. Yeah. That bridge is going to shift a little bit farther south, and then you'll come in under that in the median, and then another lane will be added into the median for 495 under Fruit Street. So one of the reasons that Fruit Street yeah, from sorry. 495 south in the median, I take it, because you have. Cruise Street on your on both sides of here, mm -hmm. and you're going to shoot another lane to the go eastbound on the pipe. So all of the alternatives <coughs> um, add a acceleration and deceleration lanes to the ramps. That's why you see us extending the limits here as far as they do. Uh, part of that is right now you have very short acceleration and deceleration lanes, mm -hmm. so you don't have a lot of time to slow down or speed up before you're forced in with regular traffic or forced off of the highway onto the ramp. How, how long is it uh, acceleration lane or deacceleration lane on uh, average? So it really depends on the design speed of the ramp compared to the highway speed of the main roadway. Uh, the higher the design speed of the main roadway and lower the design speed of the ramp, the bigger the, the longer the uh, acceleration or deceleration lane needs to be. So the nice part is by having these high speed ramps, those acceleration and deceleration lanes get to be a little shorter. Now I will throw a caveat in with this ramp coming in on the inside. Yeah. In order to allow for vehicles to not have to change lanes when they're entering, going southbound because they're coming in on the high speed lane, that lane becomes an add lane, and we take away a lane from the outside to maintain the same three-lane section that there is today. So about 2,000 feet south of the, inter of the interchange, somewhere right around down there, coincidentally enough right at the bottom of the sheet, um, the outside lane that had been coming down you know, from, from 290 all the way down ends and that new lane that came in on the left side continues on in its place. So the Fruit Street Bridge needs to be widened to take in all these lanes? Right, so the reason we're reconstructing, there's two reasons we're reconstructing the bridge. One, the piers and abutments, like you're, like you're thinking, aren't in a position that allow for the, accel the acceleration and deceleration lanes to be extended. That's one of the reasons why they're as short as they are today. Uh, to shift 495 northbound closer to the median and to allow for this ramp to come in as an ad lane, the center pier of Fruit Street that's in the median today is in the way as well. What do you think the minimum posted speed on that high speed ramp at the curve would be? So, uh, the one coming in in the median? Yes. That one is 55 miles an hour. How much? Design, it's a 55 mile an hour design speed, so it would be, a whole, so it'd be drop five miles an hour, it'd be a 50 mile an hour posted. Just in general, I think having a lane coming in from the left, as you say, you're also going to have a lane coming in from the right, and even now, just um, traffic coming in 
from um, the Pike eastbound on there. The traffic coming down 495 slows down now just with that amount of traffic. And if now you're putting another lane coming in from the other side, I think that's going to be a problem. Yeah, I mean, with, with all designs, there are certainly you know, challenges and you know, certainly opportunities too. But you know, the, there are certain challenges with having a, a median entrance. It's not a, an incorrect design. Um, but there would be some, it would be a little bit harder for people who wanted to, didn't want to be in the high speed lane to move over because they're already in the high speed lane. This, this project here has less ad, it has a less adverse effect on wetlands and the environment. Is that? This alternative has the least impact. The least, okay. Is that true? Okay. And would there be anticipated uh, uh, truck lane restrictions and there are through that intersections? Yeah, so theoretically, um, just like any other, once you're in the three lane section, trucks, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but trucks are not allowed in the left lane on, on three lane highways in Massachusetts. Which is one of the concerns with that left hand entrance because those trucks, you know, first of all, they're trucks, so they're going slower, they're a bit bulkier, less, more unwieldy, so they need to immediately not just get into that lane, which is an, ex, which is an on ramp only lane, which is good, but they immediately need to move into the other lane. So, yeah. not, not ideal. Like Jonathan said, it's not a design flaw, it's not a fatal flaw. We do have these left side entrances. Federal Highway does allow them. Uh, they're not preferable. So I just have one question. So where you have people coming from the left and the right, is there only one lane in the middle for through traffic? No, there or are still two. three lanes. There's still three? Okay. So that lane that I said was dropped doesn't occur until well after the interchange. Okay. In fact, that's a requirement that it occurs well okay. after the interchange. So there's for still that, the for three, that very reason that you're the three and then the two yeah. come into that. Okay. And then I'll just emphasize one more time here that these loop ramps, the same configuration for exiting and entering, minus these two movements, are maintained in this alternative. Doesn't that kind of conflict with what you're trying to do on the, where the toll plaza used to be? Isn't that for all the weaving is, right? Right, yeah. so removing these two movements allows us to barrier off a couple directions. I can see a little bit better down here. The uh, image gets pixelated a bit. Clearer on the boards. You know, if you're coming off the pike from eastbound and you want to go 495 northbound, you've got to jump over two lanes. So it's, it's actually two, it'll, it'll be a two lane section there because you don't have so the traffic coming over this way that's going northbound would be separated by a barrier. And then you have a two lane section that diverges, and that can show you a little bit clearer down here, that diverges right about here and allows them and shifts them over. And then they merge together into a two lane section and continue up. But does it remove, correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, this one doesn't remove, each one of these options kind of plucks one more of those weaving movements today out of the mix and gives it its own dedicated ramp. So on this one, you've taken what, two of the weaves out and well, given them dedicated all the weaves, ramps? All the weaves are eliminated as See? part of the project. Even better. In all alternatives. So there's the, what he said. What you, what you get is less travel in this general area as movements are taken out. You have dedicated ramps where you don't have to make a decision. Uh, yeah. right. Before you get to oh, I forget to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> and we realize the stuff to see on the screen like this. That's why we brought the board. So if, if you want to take a nice closer look at it afterwards. We all this year, we all drive that, so we know where. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, That's why we don't talk a lot yeah. about project background, because we know that folks, if they're out here, they, they understand the problems. Yeah, just a little preview of what's coming. Each alternative will eliminate more of the tight, uh, difficult geometry that's out there right now. So as we go, you'll see less and less of what you see on the screen and more direct connections. When I look at out yeah. in the future, what's that going to do to the Fruit Street Bridge? That, that road is heavily traveled now. You can <coughs> drop it down a, one lane each way? while you're reconstructing it? Uh, generally, we, we haven't gone into the reconstruction yeah. phases yet, but certainly well, we've all driven Fruit Street and we know that it, it is well-traveled and there are not a lot of alternatives. So that will play into how we stage that to make it work for everyone. Emergency services, you know, school, all, all those things are important. 
We're, it's a great question. It's a question we're going to answer. At this point, we're still okay. working on selecting a single alternative. So I probably have this wrong, but I think I read on the website that the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Health and Human Services and and in the eastern part of the state travel through this intersection. No, you're better. So if we improve it, do you anticipate more than 50% of all the trucks will now be going through that intersection as a projection? I don't think there's freight for projections to go up. Are there, Jessica? Oh, yeah, I'm just saying uh, our, our traffic engineer is sitting right behind you. So. We, um, we received projected growth data from CTPS, who they develop sort of like a regional model of the state um, and based on future land use come up with these growth patterns for us to use. Um, so they did project, you know, freight growth or heavy truck growth, if that's specifically freight or not. Um, but I wouldn't say it's, you know, like doubling it or anything, but it, there will be growth. There's not a lot of alternatives to travel through here that if we suddenly fix this, they're suddenly going to come back to here. So. Part of the reason why some of the trucks I think some of us here are, this is all well and good, but no one's concerned the quality of life around there. I mean, you know, Mr. Barlini has quite a development on one side. We live in the Roosevelt Farm area. I mean, the trucks every night, yeah. it, it's loud. Yeah, sure. I mean, what, 10 years ago, they put up a, a wooden fence to quiet the noise. It really hasn't helped. I think I... It's actually falling down. It's a yes. Yeah, yes. Ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, are we in line to get like a sound wall then? Um, I mean, where well, you're going to have these trucks going through at a high speed now, they're not quiet at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. The answer to that is yeah. we'll see. definitely maybe. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't mind to belittle no, your point yeah. because it's, it's, it's very well heard and, and understood. Um, again, we're at this conceptual level. Right. Right. Um, this project qualifies as a type one mm -hmm. uh, it, um, transportation project, which requires mass de requires under state and federal laws and regulations requires mass DOT to do a noise analysis. One to determine if you're impacted now. Two to project into the future to see what the noise volumes are in the future. So we have started that. Uh, I think maybe some of you folks have had um, some of our sub consultants out in your yard setting up noise, noise monitors for short term uh, noise data collection. That'll be part, uh, probably completed in the next year or so. That's really part of the, the MEPA process, the EIR. Um, and we'll, they, they, uh, this isn't really the time to get into it, but they're pretty strict um, and well laid out, both federal laws and state regulations and guidelines and how we look at those and when when we can reasonably and feasibly build noise barriers. And so the good news is it's a type one project, yes we're absolutely gonna look at it and, and hopefully uh, particularly that neighborhood. It's got it's got it, it's way too detailed, right? Need no, to sit no, down no. To, our, to sit down and go through the calculations for it. But your question? I mean in addition to the acoustics, will there be air quality tests going on? Um, I don't think that's normally part of what we do. Why would that be? We do no. greenhouse gas. There's a, there's a, uh, I mean, uh, when you think of all the automotive crash and trucks, and you know, yeah, it's going to affect the air and everything. You know. in, in regards to that, um, and you'll see later in the, in the measures of effectiveness when we get to them, the uh, a lot of the air quality is interconnected with congestion on the roadways, so the longer vehicles are sitting there just idling, spewing out whatever fumes come out of those vehicles, that's just sitting there. Um, the better traffic moves, the less time those vehicles are actually spending around your home. So the more fluid this is, the less noise and the, and the faster the traffic will move. It's I can't. I, but I have learned a long time ago never to speak about noise. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting louder. It's not, you know. Yeah, well, it's the faster the traffic, the louder it is. A car going at 55 makes more noise than a car going at. I just thought for the shifting of the trucks and everything. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You would have that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just when you, when you look at it, aerial view at the map, it's kind of oh, disheartening because 
Now you've got, I mean, we're like trapped between all these major highways. And there's going to be more traffic, and there's going to be more noise, and there's going to be more stench, and I don't know. There's, I mean, I'm right in that bubble. And it's just, I, I understand the necessity for change and progress. It's just that I'm living in it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm living in it. There might be less horns. You know, oh. Less what? <laughs> less horns. <laughs> A lot less horns, less accidents, maybe. Less um, sirens. Those are the kind of things we'll look at pretty heavily in the MEPA process. Okay. So 14.5. Um, so the big change here is we start to eliminate the the uh, loop ramps. So you can see right here, this loop ramp is eliminated, and we do that by creating a direct connection off of the same place where we came off to go southbound. So this is your westbound to northbound connection. Since that's out of the picture over here, we can do a forward ramp going westbound for all the set, all for both northbound and southbound to use to go westbound. And again, eliminate that entire loop ramp. Other than that, that's the big change in 14.5 between 14.4. And you can see it's a very similar looking layout with that one change. Any questions on this one? So that one loop that you're making going north, are there any residential, is that, no, are there Cumberland homes County. in there? Yeah. I'm just Cumberland Farms. Yeah. It's just wet ones. Yeah. Wet okay. ones in that well, big Cumberland Farms regional distribution. How did the truck like get built in the first place? I knew this, yeah. It's yeah. a long time ago, yeah. right here. Yeah. It was called Swamp. It was called Swamp. Right, right, right. We do things differently yeah. these days, fortunately. Well, if I, am I reading it wrong? If you're getting rid of one of those loops near the residential yeah. area and you're offsetting it and putting it north where it really won't be affecting any residents, is that a better plan? Oh, it, 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 it provides for a yeah, better connection. Um, well, not the turtles. Yeah, I mean, from, a, from, from, from west not the turtles. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll talk about that. Yeah. And theoretically, it would move less traffic through the old toll plaza area, simply because yeah. well, it's going over there now. So all those cars that are trying to make that westbound and northbound are a lot further away from your house at this point. Well, yeah, I mean, it, that yeah. seems like a better choice so nine, the people. And fortunately for me, the it, right, well, fortunate for me, there's nobody, I'm not moving it closer to anybody else's house. Right, right, right. So to me, that's, that's a better plan. I mean, I see one right. other blue line that comes through, but... Um, it looks like a smoother transition. I don't see people throwing their brakes on when they're making a loop. It looks like a nice, clean, clean cut. So, okay. This is exactly the kind of input yeah. we're looking for. We we spent thank you. Yeah, so, nine, hours. so ninety east, ninety west. We is completely out of that yeah. merge. Yeah. The toll, the old toll booth area. Completely bypass. Exactly, yeah. and that's kind of what Nate and Jonathan, it's like a bowl of yeah. spaghetti, and part of the reason why it's yeah. unsafe and you got all those cars stopped is because yeah. it's a bowl of spaghetti. You start Ooh. pulling those strands yeah. out, it makes it a lot smoother and kind of more spread. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. 22.3 uh, takes it another step farther. So, a lot of them, every movement at this point would have its own uh, direct ramp. You can see this lobe right here, these set of loop ramps, just like this one over here in 14.5, is eliminated. And that is done by shifting the crown of Fruit Street so that it's on the bridge instead of being over here. I'm sure you've all driven that spot, you're kind of going up and you don't really see the bridge ahead of you and then all of a sudden you get to the top and you see the bridge in front of you and, it's nice and the bridge is nice and flat. So instead of having that tough to see over crown on this side, right by the country club, we would put the crown farther over on the bridge, and that would, one, make the sight, the sight lines on Fruit Street better, and two, allow us to do a forward ramp under Fruit Street and then over 495. That goes through and then over and, and onto I 90 westbound. So you would no longer have any low speed ramps and low speed is a 45 mile an hour 
Well, that's not, I'm sorry, that's not quite correct. This ramp, one loop ramp right here, would remain under 45 miles an hour. But all the other ramps would be designed to that speed or higher. I will say that this does have more impact than all the other ramps, all the other alternatives. So by putting in this ramp over here that connects from southbound to westbound, we are impacting the wetland area over here, crossing the Sudbury River, crossing the MBTA. Uh, we are putting a very high, very long flyover through the wetland right here. It's about, by the time it crosses 495, it's about 55 feet high. That's up there. Um, well, we have the, the, uh, the houses. For all the alternatives, 424, 425, and 23, the flyover that's coming in the median is about the same height. And each one of those two flyover bridges, uh, the one coming in on the median, so the southbound to, or the westbound to southbound, and the eastbound to northbound on 22.3, uh, those two are about half a mile long. Would that high flyover be visible from the Roosevelt Farms neighborhood? I, I would imagine it's highly obstructed by vegetation. We'll I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. We'll look into that one. Yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Any questions on this one? Maybe you could do a big dig and just put it underground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then you'd get a swell vent building. <laughs> yeah, that would take a lot of noise. You might have some getting, out, getting around the groundwater out here. <laughs> yeah, just take the pipe, bury it, 495, bury it. And <laughs> We're happy. Put it in a park. <laughs> The turtles and frogs. We've heard you did it before in Boston. <laughs> We're getting our environmental guys really excited. <laughs> and then, uh, so finally, the concept of that evolved out of the refinement process, C2. So the big change here between the, alter the three previous alternatives and C2 is that instead of having it come in through the median, the westbound to southbound movement, it stays in the toll plaza area by shifting over. The advantage of that is that now we can build the northbound lanes of 495 completely in the median without having to do traffic shifts or take a lot of time to maneuver around the old bridge. The other advantage is that property over here, uh, which belongs to DCR, is not disturbed. All the other alternatives, because we can't move the main line over enough, this ramp ends up cutting the DCR property, the northbound to eastbound. You stand. Yeah. The other flyovers are your northbound, the same one that was used to saw in 22.3, your northbound to westbound. You can kind of see it coming through here. You and also, that's 55 feet. No, these are these are generally lower. These are in your 40 to 45 foot range at most. And that would just be this one. All the rest are much, much lower. Well, that's better. I like that one. <laughs> and then there's a flyover from eastbound to northbound that crosses over the uh, northbound to westbound. And the reason why that Where is that coming from? Sure. So, so it looks like it's coming you start from here. 90 east and going to 90 east. You start, you start, yeah, sure. So you start at 90 east, yeah. you come off, and I'm going to jump down here. We're, we're yeah. here and blow up. Yeah. You take the split. You're on the left side. You go under and then up on the bridge, and over, and then we're back up here. Oh, 495 north. 495 northbound. I think where it gets confusing is right there. It looks like it cuts back over. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, cro <laughs> it's crossing. <laughs> it's crossing right there, yeah. Okay. What is the, say, time frame between now and you actually put a shovel in the ground? Five years? We'll talk. We'll, that's part of the presentation. The Any further questions?
Well, that one area where I see the, the teardrop, let's just say, it comes really down to the neighborhoods. I mean, I know you've got roads there, and it's probably the most co cost-effective way to run it, but do all of those ribbons have to go through that circle? I mean, can you tighten that thing up and instead of such a big teardrop coming so close to the residence, I mean, do, does that circle have to be that big? Can it be a little bit tighter? I mean, I'm sure you've got speed and radius and all that kind of thing. I, I'm assuming you're doing it just because the roadway exists there and it would be the cheapest option. So we are trying to hit certain design speeds. Uh, okay. This alternative does not, uh, also like 22.3 does not have a, uh, a ramp that has a less than 40 mile an hour design speed. You just want to keep track of moving. Faster or better. Well, and, and you see that, you know, the problem that exists today are those tight blueprints. We're trying to avoid the tight blueprints. Yeah. They're the source of the safety right. problems. Right. The, the 495 the north where they all truck turnover. So tightening, right. increasing <laughs> the radius improves mm -hmm. the vehicle yeah. flow and the safety. Sure. And yeah. that, that, that circle is much larger than the two smaller circles right. that have been omitted. Right. So it's a bigger, it's a bigger... Right, so right now when you come off, you're kind of coming down and then you still hit that straight area that existed from the old toll plaza, so it's kind of squished mm -hmm. up, but you're going around a tight curve and then you're straightening out so you can speed up, and then you're going around a tight curve again so you have to slow down. So you see a reason yeah. why you need to add that line in that loop? It can't be its own separate line outside yeah, of that loop? Yeah, on the previous one, you know coming I mean? 495 south to 90 west, you had... A straighter line. It wasn't. You really had a new ramp there, and I see that that's gone. Yeah, I mean, part so of what was the reason. Part of the refinement process, we can look at tightening this up and trying to get it a little bit farther. This one ramp, the eastbound to southbound movement, we can look at trying to tighten that up. Are those still separated, or does that bring the weave back in? No weaving. No weaving. In this. Okay. Every every merge or or, or two lane <laughs> exit does not require you to shift lanes. You do have to choose your, just, your destination. No, but once, you, once you come on to what direction you're going, you have a lane all the way onto the main line. Now that's going to be determined on the turnpike, what lane you're going to get into. It's not when you're running halfway through the ramp. you got to go north or south. Uh, never halfway through the ramp. There are I mean, some, but there are some, um, yeah, there are some <laughs> points where you... Generally, there are single-point exits minus um, uh, the turnpike westbound. So that's actually a good feature to point out. So if you're Turnpike Westbound, instead of having a single exit, which all the other all the other alternatives have, you have an exit for northbound, and then a period a small period of time where it's just a three-lane roadway again, and then you have an exit, which let's call it uh, 11 B, <laughs> and uh, that would be your your exit for southbound. I think it's actually the other way around. I think it's B A. But, yeah. yeah, and so you, you converge, but you don't have to weave. So you would still be entering into your own lane. It's just two movements kind of converge into one ramp to enter on 495 South. And that eliminates the left side entrance ramp that was in those other alternatives. So there's no situation in here where you enter on the left side of the highway. Right, so let's say you were going from, uh, let's say you were going from westbound to here tonight using, using 495. Uh, in all the other situations, say 22.3, you come down, you come down into the median, and then over the course of the, we'll say two and a half miles, you need to cross three lanes of traffic, and then get into the exit lane. Whereas here, you're already on the side where your destination is. So there's a level of expectation that you get by being on the right side right from the start. When you said you had to converge, does that mean there are two cars merging to one lane? Mm -hmm. uh, no, they have their own lane. Uh, Eventually, once you're on the main line, like all acceleration and deceleration lanes, they disappear. <clears throat> that's, that's a ways down the road. If you go back one slide, and then go... 495 South, going to 90 West. You see that little purple that you put in there, like a direct? Mm -hmm. What was the reason for taking that out? 
So not that one. Four ninety five southbound. Four ninety five southbound is westbound. This one right, right here. See that purple. purple. So and this corner, you know, out. this corner right here, mm -hmm. is cutting into the uh, the wetland area significantly. And the ACDC. It also crosses the new crossing across the Sudbury River. Another new crossing on the Sudbury River, and also crosses another new crossing over the MBK Red Line. So it's almost entirely structured for a very short ramp. It is almost entirely structured, minus that little bit right there. A general question, not with any of these, but have you um, looked at cultural resource issues? The, I know there, Cedar Swamp has some archaeological sites that were identified long ago. Probably the whole area has been vastly disturbed when the pike and 495 went in originally, but has that been looked at? Is that going to be looked at in case that would affect any of these designs? It is going to be looked at, yes. Okay. It has been and will continue to be. This is the end of the four alternatives, if anyone has any other questions on the alternatives. I just wanted to point out the, the height or the structure of 22.3. The reason why on C2 in particular, they can be the reason why it's so high on this is because you're going over uh, two sections. You're going so I 90 is here, and then 495 is above it, and then that's got to go up over that as well. None of the rest of them go over two facilities, they go up over one. So it's a standard. It's a like the Tappan Z bridge area. <laughs> I don't know why. I know. So Brooklyn Bridge, did you put these four scenarios in level of monetary, like this is the least expensive, that's the most expensive? Oh, that's a good we, segue. We, we <laughs> have. <laughs> you guys are good. Waiting for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, is that a yes? Yes. But did among you, other things. We did not We did not rank them. What, we, what you're going to see coming up is just data placed okay. for each alternative, and we'll discuss some of the positives, some of the, some of the challenges, and... Um, we just want to hear your feedback. Okay. Because there's probably two categories that are red flags for you guys. Number one would be the money, right? And number two would be the environmental impact. And I don't know if they're in order, if the both are intertwined, or they get pulled apart in your analysis, but I guess we'll see. Let's roll through. Yeah, we, we, when we started, I think we had over 100 criteria, and we, and we, and we added data across the alternatives for each of those criteria. And we've, we've, ones that didn't have a difference across criteria and maybe weren't that important criteria, we've kind of put in the background. What we're gonna show you today, I think there's 26 of them that are uh, both important and or have a difference across alternatives to help us all make decisions on preferred level. Okay. Let's roll right into that. All right. So the first thing we did, we took these four alternatives that we've refined and crafted as much as possible in concept level. Um, and put them up against the project purpose again to determine whether or not they meet the project purpose. So each alternative, as we talked about before, it's safety and traffic operation improvement. So each alternative must improve on the no-build predicted conditions for the safety and traffic operations, and that's for every movement within the interchange. So if it doesn't make anything better, it doesn't meet the project purpose. So what we found is, is that while all the alternatives improve on traffic conditions, one alternative did not improve on safety for all traffic movements. And that alternative was 14.4. Therefore, alternative 14.4 did not meet purpose and need. And from this point forward, we won't be discussing 14.4 because it doesn't meet the project purpose. I think that's important to understand. This is, this is a, a transportation project. We've determined that the project purpose and need is to improve safety and improve congestion. The department's not interested in spending a considerable amount of your and my money to build something that doesn't improve safety that not only from an interchange standpoint but all of the different segments in here. So we've determined that 14.4 does not improve safety at every one of them. So we're, mm -hmm. we are, because we have other viable alternatives, and because it doesn't need project purpose, we're, we're not going to analyze that. And then I'll just highlight on, on this chart right here, 
which is showing your predicted future crashes compared to the no build condition. You have this line up here, the ramps coming from 495 and going to I-90. And you can see right here that we just do not get an improvement compared to no build. And if you remember, 14.4 has those two loop ramps still maintained. So as you go across, you can see 14.5 only does a little bit better, but it still has one of those loop ramps. Once both loop ramps are gone, you can see the drastic improvement between C2 and 22.3. If I would make hazard a guess, I know you're leaning towards 22.3, right? Well, let's show, let's show you the data. The department does not have a preferred alternative. The secretary has, has made clear that she's not going to make a decision on what we're going to build until she gets the environmental agencies' input. We've met with them a couple times as stakeholders' input. We've met with them several times in the public input. That's what we're doing here tonight and Thursday night and next Monday night and next Tuesday night. So, we want to hear from you on what you don't like, what you don't like, particularly about um, the matrix that we're about to show you. Okay. So then we took the remaining three alternatives, 14.5, 22.3, and C2, and we put them up against some measures to see how effective they are, hence measures of effectiveness. Uh, there are 26 parameters across seven categories. Like Ryan said, there were over, let's say, well over, 100 categories or parameters when we first started and we narrowed those down to the ones that best define the, per the uh, what we're trying to do in this interchange and improvements for safety and operations. Um, and which ones best compare and contrast against each other. So ones that generate, for the most part, ones that all do the same thing evenly. You won't see those. There are a few that we're going to show just because it's important to create on for you to see how much improvement you're getting out of this. But in general, we're not going to show a lot of ones that, a lot of uh, parameters that, that contrast, or that do not contrast. So there are seven categories, safety and mobility, traffic, mobility, and operations, which is these two right here, purpose and need. We just talked about the fact they had to meet purpose and need. Uh, environmental considerations, construction challenges, how's it gonna get built? Uh, economic impacts, uh, system preservation, that's how's it going to get maintained, and cost. So each we have a table for each one of these categories. It's a lot to take in. I'm going to highlight the, the uh, parameters and then hit a couple ones that are important uh, from our perspective. But if you have questions about any of them, feel free to ask. And, and to, just to let folks know, so we do have four of these public meetings. The last one is a week from tonight. At that point, this whole presentation will be up on our web page. At the end, we're going to show you the URL for the project-specific web page. So if you want to kind of look at it more closely um, and get down into the details, you'll be able to do so at that point. And if you have any questions, we also have a project-specific email that comes to myself, to Nate, and to somebody else back at the office. So feel free to reach out to us through that as well. Okay, so safety. Um, up here you have your crashes, and in, in this table, instead of just showing crashes, what we show is how it compares to the no-build in relationship to societal cost. So the cost to um, traffic moving through, the cost to the people involved in the crash, and so forth. And so you can see that 14.5 is a little bit lower than C2 and 22.3, and that again falls into that loop ramp category. Uh, over here, this one right here, which they all hit pretty much the exact same number, uh, what you're seeing there is the reduction in congestion related crashes. So the queuing onto the main lines and the rear end crashes and side swipe crashes and angle crashes that you might get from congestion. Uh, number of weaving movements, that's all eliminated as part of the project. Uh, low speed curves, those are the, again, those loop ramps. So the more that are eliminated, the, the less there are. Uh, number of left side entrances, that's that ramp coming right in in a median. And you can see, again, C2 does not have that, 14.5 and 22.3 do. And then visibility and distance 
um, to your decision points. That's your sight distance to seeing where you're going to go. Uh, mobility and operations category. Um, this one's bit, uh, nice and short because it's generally going to tell you that everything will be a lot better than it is today. <laughs> uh, you can see right here that the, the uh, no build has 38 segments in. If you break it down, if we broke it down into uh, segments to analyze, and there are 38 segments that are at or exceeding capacity in uh, the year 2040, whereas we're 90 percent less for the other three alternatives. And then your delay in vehicle hours traveled, they drop dramatically as well. Any questions on the first two, by the way? I don't want to get too far in and have you guys forget something that you wanted to ask. Uh, environmental considerations. So we have wetland impacts, um, ordering land subject to flooding, opportunities for on-site mitigation. And I'll just explain that one really fast. The, when you do work on wetlands, when you cause impact to wetlands, you need to mitigate it by replicating wetlands in other locations. Uh, this project has an opportunity to replace the wetlands that were eliminated when the interchange was originally built. So those loop ramps that we talked about before, as we remove those lobes, we actually have an opportunity to replace the wetlands in the Cedar Swamp area. And what's the other side called? Is there a name to that area? Oh, the DCR side. Excellent. And the DCR side. <laughs> Property acquisition, they all have a little bit. Uh, 223 has a little bit more. Uh, most of that is the Cumberland Farms property. Uh, Article 97, property impacts. Uh, that is that one ramp, your northbound to eastbound on I-90 ramp. And remember, I was talking about how by shifting on C2 all the way into the median, we could avoid the DCR property. The Article 97 is a legislative act that has to be taken in order to acquire DCR property. Article 97 is a constitutional amendment, right? Correct. So it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> So you're right to clean water and clean air. It's, it's yeah. That's big deal. Part of the Massachusetts Constitution. Article 97. Uh, temporary wetland impacts, that's part of construction. You can see 223 has considerably more temporary impacts to the wetland. And air quality, well, we don't have direct answers on that. You can see that, that generally because traffic, it will improve air quality. And we could work. We're going to have a, a thorough MEPA process, an environmental impact report under under MEPA, and it's going to go into that. We'll have staff here that can answer your questions at that point. Um, what Jonathan said, and, and it's not any of our technical area, so you're going to get a better answer at that meeting. Um, what Jonathan said, I think, is accurate. When cars are sitting there, and, and it's not just the volume of gases that they're emitting, it's the concentration of the, maybe the particular harmful ones that are higher. And as soon as that car starts moving, the, the, the amount that it's spewing goes down considerably. So this is, from a greenhouse gas standpoint, this is a considerable improvement to the environment. I'm not sure if greenhouse gases are exactly your question, but I think it's along the same line. So I mean, my, my thought process is so much simpler than that. I mean, I know I don't know anything about the gases that come out of the pipes, it, whether you're standing still or in motion. It's just the it's almost going to be a trade-off because yes, you're not going to be stopping anymore, but there's going to be a lot more folks on that um, um, interchange. So volume versus the argument about what's coming out of the pipes, I guess. It yeah. may be a wash. It may Jessica, be a wash. I, I, I'm not sure if it's, it's an accurate statement to say that we're going to have a considerable higher number of cars going through here. Do what are the project? Do you have a? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but is there, you have a general percentage increase that CTPS predicted to, to, through 2040. So they didn't give us a general percentage. It does vary by movement because of the way that they project growth. Um, I know the growth on the pike, I believe, was the lowest. Um, I think some of the movements can grow 
Um, I want to say around 15% is like the higher end, and, but most of them are lower than that. Um, but there is growth um, projected from now. We're projecting all the way to year 2040, though. So, I mean, it's a pretty long-term projection that they provided for us. And it would be really interesting if they also looked into the alternative fuels in this. I mean, you know, as a hopefully in reality, we'll see more electric than, than gas anyway. But that's very difficult for us to predict. Of course. But of course. anecdotally, right. And right. we think we all think <coughs> we'll keep our fingers cost. crossed on that one. Very, very much. So then I just did not point out the actual wetland impact numbers. So I'm going to talk first. Uh, permanent wetland impacts. The C2 and 14.5 have pretty much the same number of acreage impacts. Uh, 22 3 again is a little higher, and a lot of that is due to the direct connect ramps. So each ramp having its own connection and having to infringe on those quadrants that we weren't touching in other, other alternatives. Construction challenges. Uh, generally, they all take about the same time to construct. Uh, the impacts to traffic management, that's the way we can stage the project, the amount that can be built offline without impacting you as you're driving through. 14.5 uh, 14, uh, has more impact in that sense than 22.3 and C2. Uh, generally, that's because you're spending more time working in the interchange. There's less build out on your on your ramps from the outside. And then of course C2, you can build that entire northbound bridge right in the median. And then the complexity of construction, you can imagine that building very long, very high structures mm -hmm. and, and building down the median of a highway is a lot harder than not. <laughs> Economic impacts, uh, this one falls a lot in line with your uh, your traffic mobility and operations. So you can see that you know, your accommodation for future growth. Uh, so you're asking if there's gonna be a lot more traffic out there. If we did nothing, 20% of the growth that, that's going to occur would not be able to be handled by the interchange today, or in 2040. Yeah. Um, here, the user cost to you, the user cost to freight, or also you if you happen to drive a truck. Uh, uh, there will be a 65 to 70% uh, depending on the alternative and depending on whether you're in a passenger vehicle or a truck, depending on the alternative, compared to how much you would be spending on gasoline and, and miles on your vehicle just being in the existing interchange in 2040. And time, right? And time, sure, absolutely. Uh, then user cost during construction, and this one's interesting because it uh, takes into account the cost again to you while the project is being constructed. So you can see that a little bit less cost on C2 from 22.3 and a significantly less cost between 14.5 and C2 and 22.3 to you during construction. Now, system preservation, I won't spend a ton of time on this other than to say that if we did nothing, the cost to us all as, as, as residents of, of the Commonwealth uh, would be $137 million. And by building this, minus the, the actual capital cost, you get a reduction in cost of 25, uh, varying between 25 and 15 million in your maintenance costs over the course. Oh, that's 75 year period. Anybody have any questions about that? It's kind of not intuitive if you're not in the transportation industry. So with that 100, Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, that $137 million, if we did, didn't do anything, is kind of counterintuitive. But the structures that are out there now are going to have to be replaced in the next 5, 10, 20 years. That's a 75 year look, outlook. So maintenance on those structures, replacing those structures, pavement every 20 years, that kind of thing. The next 75 years, that interchange, if we didn't do anything, would still cost us 137. And it would look exactly the same as it is. And operate exactly <laughs> So finally, cost. Um, 
we have a range of about 296 million all the way up to 413 million. That's because of the high flyovers, yeah. Yeah, more structure, more cost. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty much the, uh, the name of the game. It's not Brooklyn. It's not LA. Right. It's, you know, going towards central Massachusetts. So I don't see any, I mean, I would like that weighed in as well. So the lowest visual impact. So we are, t number one, we are taking notes. So we're getting this, this is the input. Number two, I'm going to talk at the end. I'll give you an address, a, a mailing address, and then an email address where you folks want to get together as a as a neighborhood association and write a letter in and specify these things. Yes, you've heard from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so just a quick sum up of the of the measures. They all operate much better than than the existing condition would in the future. Um, generally, these two have a better geometric safety layout than. 14.5. Uh, this one obviously has the highest cost, um, but it doesn't bring a lot more benefit because they all operate similarly than the other two. And then these two also have a lower impact to the environment than this one does in construction. Any questions on the alternatives or the, the measures? Thanks, Ryan. I mean, will there be a visual at some point where we could look at an Excel spreadsheet with those three on it and your categories and see who's the high and the low? You know, just at a glance, it would be just it would just make it so much easier because right now, based on what I've heard, it almost looks like C2 is the winner. Yeah. But but you know, if it were, were graphic for everyone, you have your categories, you have your options, you know, money impact. So kind of those seven slides all pushed into one. It's, one. Kind of, it's yeah. your presentation just netted out. I, yeah, maybe we can add a slide to the end and, and throw it up on the web page. Just you're just asking for the same information. Right. Right. So when are the categories? Yeah, a ranking. Oh, we're not. Category. We'll let you folks. You know, we, yeah. we want you to rank them as well. We don't want to tell you our ranking. We want to hear your input. But summarizing them in a more concise way, I think we can. Do yeah, I mean, there's some data that is is uh, not make, debatable. It'll make like it easier cost. to read. Right, or the impact the on the environment. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it is what it is. It's black and white. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's there, yeah. So and then there's some that are more subjective, on. maybe, and yeah. you might leave yeah. those, you know, open or Well, I'm not, not sure. We, we're not going to rank them, but, but what we will do is take the, the, the those seven slides and table. put them in one table. Yeah. Okay. It's impossible to show up here. I was just going to say that, Ryan. See we any of those numbers, but we'll put it in. Maybe we'll put it at the end of the presentation when it goes up in the web page yeah. and you can look at it on your own screen yeah. and zoom in. That right. might make it easier. Yeah, we could have put them all up there, but it would have been. <laughs> I mean, you can see how the, the writing isn't exactly large as it is right now. So. If you opt to print that out, I'd suggest buying ledger sized paper. <laughs> <laughs> 11 by 17 would help. Well, the first one we had was so many, so many pages. It was several pages. I mean, basically, when you get right down to black and white, something has to be done there. From Oh yeah, I mean, no doubt. Just, no doubt. We've had two fatalities in the last what, three or four years. That, that, that's number one for the department. I mean, we live with the noise and the traffic and all this stuff, but something has to be done. I mean, it's, it yeah. is a mess. I mean, it is. I, and the Commonwealth agrees. It has yeah. to go too different. I've heard the accidents. I hear the long, long screech and then the bang at the end. And oh, it may be one of those two that we lost. I don't know, but I, I hear them. I'm that close. You just must and tense up. <laughs> when you hear the screech, you must tense up and then wait to see it. Now that the trains are gone, though, there's less of that. Okay. 
But louder noise because everyone's flying noise. through it. So. A lot more noise. And the trucks hit their brakes. So, if one's essentially off the table, why do you present all four? Is that still an option? Because fourteen four was in the sec the MEPA secretary certificate on the ENF. So we're it was in a planning study before any of us got involved. It was in the ENF. Secretary of uh, EOEA told us to look further into it. We've looked further into it, said doesn't meet purpose and need. We're no longer going to analyze it. We've talked with the MEPA folks. We've got good justification for it, and they're okay with that. So it will still be in the draft EIR, but it will be talked about up front and dismissed early on. And then only the only the... Just because we think it's no longer viable, we need to tell people that it's no longer viable and why. And that's, what, that's why you've seen it. Makes sense. Thank you. And just for folks who don't breathe this for a living, <laughs> EOEA is the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. They control the MEPA process through which MassDOT has to go. Just Sorry. curious, what, what spurred the C2 alternative? It sounds like that was added on after the other or three. So, okay, we'll put a slide back. 22.3, part of the refinement process, there used to be a loop ramp that instead of this movement, the northbound to westbound movement, which was to ramp, <coughs> there was a very tight loop ramp that was squeezed in right in this area right here. And that caused a number of things that were undesirable for this particular alternative. One, this loop ramp was as small as these loop ramps are here and here. Two, that loop ramp went through DCR, entirely through DCR property and over the MBTA railroad tracks on structure all the way from one highway to the other. <laughs> Three, it also went over the Sudbury River. It also pushed it. Yep. The ramp going <coughs> north from westbound, westbound to northbound ramp, was closer to Cumberland Farms. Mm -hmm. And this ramp, the northbound on-ramp that was coming from eastbound, so the eastbound to northbound ramp, had to, be go had to go farther. This portion here, coming on to northbound as well, had to go farther east. So it caused a lot more impact on 22.3. By shifting it over here, we were able to eliminate that. Secondly, we looked at this on-ramp coming down the middle of the highway and thought, could we not do that? What could we do to not do that? So by combining this element that we created in 22.3, plus some of the other good elements of 22.3 and 14.4 and 14.5, <coughs> the on-ramp over here and the direct connect going eastbound from northbound. We added in the elimination of the median on-ramp by moving it a little farther west and back on the right-hand side. And that's what created C2. Thank you. <coughs> so next steps. This is, like I said, the part one of the meetings of the second round, environmental agency stakeholders, it's a considerable number of these public meetings. Uh, we're going to continue to have these. We're going to gain all of your input. Um, hopefully later this fall or this winter, we'll have all that condensed and the administration will be able to make a decision on what that preferred alternative is. At that point, we'll come out again, setting just like this, and tell you which alternative was selected as the preferred alternative and why. Uh, then we'll quickly get right into that MEPA EIR phase. And if folks who haven't seen the EIR, it's a document about this thick with a bunch of, even with a bunch of electronic appendices. Um, it kind of analyzes the existing conditions, project purpose and need, alternatives, benefits, mitigation. Uh, and then also it, we'll have a MEPA hearing sometime next year on that. It's where we'll have an expert to talk more about the air quality stuff. And then we'll also get into 25% design. We'll also have a 25% design public hearing to show people 
the preferred alternative at 25, further, further than normal. So there would be multiple more opportunities for you to hear from us on project status and what we're thinking, why we're doing what we're doing, and to get, a, get your input. Sure. Schedule, we showed this last time, and it's still uh, fairly well accurate. Uh, going back into 2017, we determined the first purpose in that we need. We've been refining alternatives, uh, alternative analysis. You've seen the culmination of that tonight. Uh, we're going to gather this data. We're going to have a recommended preferred alternative. We're going to get through NEPA and NEPA and 25% design up through 2020. Um, even though we're minimizing our wetland impacts, it's still fairly significant impact, so it requires a variance from the State Wetlands Protection Act, which is a fairly long, uh, thorough, complicated process. So we'll be in that process uh, 20, most of 2020 and 2021, uh, and then this project is slated to go design to build, which means that this team will take it to 25% design, and we'll kind of put that on the street and ask contractors and engineering firms to team up together and tell us Number one, why we should pick them. Number two, how much they would charge us to then carry the project through 100% design and construction. That'll go out to advertisement for that putting on the street. Uh, I think October 2021 is what our current schedule says. They'll fairly quickly start um, construction. The benefit of that design build methodology is that because you have the engineer sitting next to the contractor, they can say, contractor can say, hey, I'd like to get started as soon as possible. Can you design this section? And it might be one of those ramps that's offline. So they'll go ahead and design that, and, and then the contractor will start building while the design is kind of progressing. It kind of melds the whole thing, gets it, gets it built maybe a little quicker and, and sooner. Um, through, so 2022 through 2025, 2026, that's probably need to update all that. So we're going to continue to have these public and stakeholder meetings. That is our website. And if you just Google I-495, I-90, yep. interchange reconstruction, it'll come right off of that. Uh, I think this email address is on that web page. It is. So if, if at any time you're up 2 o'clock in the morning and you're thinking about this, Google this, find it, shoot an email, like I said. Myself, Nate, and Donnie Daly back at the office to all monitor this is. email. So we're doing this. Sure. I'm sure. I, I, I love these. Yeah, and here's our contact information. Um, okay. We're soliciting input. Like I said, we've, we're taking meeting notice, so we're going to pull your comments and your questions into um, some sort of recommendation to the secretary, to the administration. Uh, if you feel like you want to write a letter, um, and for your neighborhood organization or behalf of yourself, please do so and just send it to that email address and we'll, we'll include it in part of the process. I guess the only thing that I'd add is that we're doing this Thursday night in Worcester, Monday in Bolton, and finishing on Tuesday in Milford. So if you happen to have friends that live in those towns, let them know, because the more audience and participation we get, the better off we do. And it's the same presentation. We're, yep. we're, we're just kind of spreading it out. Um, we know that a lot of folks, you folks, happen to live right there. A lot of folks that use the interchange might live 20 miles north or 12, 30 miles west or 20 miles south. So in an, in an effort to really kind of make it easy for people to, to give us their input, we've kind of spread out a little bit. And it may be premature because you don't have any data on acoustics yet, but no part of your presentation ever went into the, the human factor part of it, which would be, I mean, it would be candy to my ears to hear you say, if it were that the test came back that we needed to build a wall, this would be where we would build it and what kind of wall it would be and give us some sense of some security, knowing that, that those thoughts are going on and it's a part of the process, but it's not even a bullet up there. It's definitely part of the process. Again, this presentation is focused on getting input on which alternative, okay. regardless of which alternative, we're going to go through that noise analysis. Right. And if it's determined to be reasonable and feasible, and those are very technical definitions, state and federally, then, then we, I don't want to say required to build a noise barrier, because it's more like we're happy to build a noise barrier. We're happy to include it as part of the project. But yeah, we, we are required to build it, but uh, that we, we're at a conceptual level. So we just don't, we need to refine so even just the geometries of the highway 
um, to build into the noise, the federal <coughs> noise model, to then kind of spit out that. So you need to know your alternative that yeah. you're selecting. Yeah, and I think we're going to do the, the noise study on all of the alternatives. Um, but again, that's that's a little bit further, further, further down the road. Brian, is this the the layout you had with the the time frame? Is the oh, you have got it right there. Final design and construction is 24, 25. It'll more likely be, we need to change this slide a little bit. It'll start in 2022 and probably go through 2026. Okay. No, because I did see you said four years to build it. Yes, just, that's so why we need to change uh, this. Okay. It, it, it's slated to advertise for design build in October of 2021. So construction will probably start 2022 sure. up through 2026. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's been informative. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. If you have any questions, again, if you think of something, we're here. We want your input. Um, mm -hmm. A couple different ways for you to get to us. So. There's no alternative to moving everything away from our neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Tighten up that bow. Tighten up that bow. There's nothing. Tight. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that road's going there. We, we are very well aware of your neighborhood. And so it's a concern. No, oh, we appreciate it. You folks, yeah. you folks love I'll actually tell you, when we first moved there, when they we did the toll booth, Peter Judge was the... No, John Judge. John Judge was the head of the Turnpike Authority. He was laying in our bed and adjusting the lights. I made him lie on our bed to adjust the lights. Over the toll plaza. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, that's all right, ma'am. I believe so, you. So, so Ryan, <laughs> don't mess with her. Don't <laughs> mess with her. <laughs> He actually came over like eight o'clock one night, laid in our bed, and had a walkie-talk and we adjusting the lights. Oh my gosh! I did. You know me. Can't do that in my house. You know me. It's fantastic. It worked. All right. Thank you again for coming.